I should like to call your attention this evening to the message of the eighth psalm, psalm number eight, which reads as follows. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. I want particularly to deal with verses 3 and 4 in this eighth psalm. When I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I suppose that of all the charges that are brought against us who are Christian, is the charge that because we are Christian, we are men and women who do not think. There are many charges brought against the Christian at the present time, but I think this is perhaps the commonest. That we are people who don't think. We are little people who contract out of life, as it were, and spend our time singing hymns and choruses and so on, and seem to be unaware of the great and marvelous things that are happening in the world outside us. This is the common view taken today of the Christian. And that is why he is a Christian, because he doesn't use his mind. He doesn't think, and he doesn't reason. Now, I want to deal with that charge this evening, and I want to deal with it through the medium of this eighth psalm and its message. Why do you think it is that the man of the world, the man who is not a Christian, why is it that he holds this view of us? that we are people who don't think. I believe the answer to that is quite simple. He comes to that conclusion simply because we don't think as he thinks, and because we don't think in the way in which he thinks. He comes to the conclusion that we don't think at all. Now this is a very important point, and to me in many ways, one of the most important things in life today, the way in which we think. What's the difference between the way in which the men of the world thinks and in which the Christian thinks? And put it, putting it briefly, we can put it like this. The men of the world thinks in a superficial manner. He is aware of things, he notices them, he reacts to them, but he soon forgets about them and reacts again to something else. And the thinking that he does is thinking that is controlled almost entirely by the newspapers and by the television and by the wireless. I'm not saying this. Prominent educationalists uh, are saying it and have said it for a number of years. I remember reading a book by a great uh, professor on education in Oxford during the last war. And he said then that it seems to me, he says, that one of the main results of popular education since 1870 up to date, is to produce a mentality that can only appreciate Beaverbrook and Metro Goldwyn. That was his way of putting it. I'm saying it in my way. That most people uh, are controlled by what they hear on the wireless and the television and what they read in the popular press. And the result of this is that their thinking is a light and a superficial thinking, a superficial reaction to the things that happen. What about the Christian? Well, the Christian, you see, is entirely different. I asked my friend Mr. Sutton to read that second chapter of Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, 
Because the great apostle sets it out there so plainly and so clearly. The Christian is a new man. He's born again. We have the mind of Christ, says Paul. We have received the Spirit, not the Spirit that is of the world, but the Spirit that is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's a new way of thinking. The Christian is not merely a man whose sins are forgiven. He's a man who's born again. All things have become new. And one of the most important things is he's got a new mind. And he thinks in a different way. What is that? Well, that's the thing that comes out, it seems to me, in this old eighth psalm. It's all here in one word, really, in the third verse. When I consider thy heavens, says the psalmist, he doesn't merely look at the heavens. He considers them. He goes on thinking, goes on looking. He asks questions, what is man, and so on. He thinks deeply. He thinks profoundly. Why does he do this? The answer is because his thinking is not determined by the newspapers and the popular media, but by the Bible. This is the truth about a Christian. His whole outlook is governed by the teaching of the Scriptures. So he looks at everything in an entirely different way from the man who is not a Christian. Well, now then, bearing that in mind, let us look at this important subject together. And let's do so, I say, in terms of the teaching of this eighth psalm. Here's a man who says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. He's a man who's looking up into the heavens at the sun and the moon and the stars. And he arrives at certain conclusions. Then the Christian and the non-Christian together look up at the same heavens at the same moon, and at the same stars. But that has an entirely different effect upon them. And so you can discover whether you're a Christian or not, simply by asking yourself, what effect does looking up at the heavens have upon me? Now that's what we're going to consider together. And we're going to do so in a very modern way. I want to expand this message of this old eighth psalm to you, in the light of something of which we are all aware and in which we are tremendously interested. What is it? Well, we are living, are we not, in the days of astronauts. Everybody today is looking up at the heavens. We are all looking at the moon and the stars. It all began, as you remember, on the 20th of July in 1969, the never-to-be-forgotten day when the Americans at long lost, and as the result of their brilliant technology, succeeded in landing two men on the surface of the moon. It was a marvelous and amazing achievement. And we were all looking up at the heavens, doing so perhaps through a television set, reading about it in the press. The whole world, in a sense, ever since, has been looking up at the heavens, at the moon and at the stars. Yes, but here's the question. What effect has that had upon you? And this is where we see the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. Christian and non-Christian are looking up at the heavens. That's not confined to the non-Christian. The Christian reads his paper. He's interested in what's happening. They're all looking together at the heavens and the moon and the stars. Yes, but the vital question is, what effect has that had upon you? What's it led to? I want to show you the difference. And do you know, in doing that, we shall determine and decide tonight beyond any question whether we are Christians or whether we are not. Had you ever thought of that before? That the result of looking up at the heavens and the moon and the stars proclaims whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. You see, the non-Christian, he looks up and he gets excited. He says, isn't it marvelous? Isn't it wonderful? Then he forgets all about it. Looks at something else, gets excited about that. And on he goes from sensation to sensation. But the Christian, he stops. He considers. He meditates. He asks questions, and he arrives at some of the profoundest conclusions a man can ever arrive at in this world and in this life. What are these conclusions? Let me expand them as this man puts them before us. The first conclusion at which the godly, the Christian man arrives as he looks up at the heaven and the moon and the stars is this, the marvel and the wonder of creation. 
You notice how he starts his very psalm. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Marvels and wonders at the greatness and the glory of God's creation. But I can hear somebody saying immediately, wait a minute, are you going to argue that it's only the Christian who appreciates the greatness and the marvel of God's creation? My dear sir, says this critic, you can't get away with that. For he says, I can prove to you, history proves, that it's you Christians who've been the greatest opponents of these marvelous discoveries. Christianity has been a kind of break upon the forward march of the human race. And it's only within the last century since people have thrown the Bible overboard and have really begun to think for themselves that we're beginning to discover the greatness and the marvel and the wonder of creation. You can't claim that it's you Christians who've discovered the greatness and the marvel of creation. You've been the very people who prevented our seeing it through putting blinkers round our eyes. Now, that's a very common argument, isn't it? You must have heard it many times. And they go on, of course, and produce their famous case. They say, what about Galileo? You know, this man Galileo, living at the end of the 16th century. This man, through looking through telescopes and making calculations, he discovered that what the church and others had always taught, namely that this planet on which we live is the center of the universe, he found this was quite wrong, and that it's the sun that's the center, and that this is just some sort of planet circulating around the sun. And he began to teach this. What happened to him? The church tried to stop him, did stop him, persecuted him, punished him. Here it is, they say, this is what's always happened. The church Christianity is always against the advance of science. And the proof is the case of Galileo. Now what do we say to that? Well, what we say to that is this. That it's perfectly true to say that the church did persecute Galileo. But it is equally true to say that it was the Roman Catholic Church that did so. And I can tell you why she did so. It wasn't because his teaching contradicted the Bible. It was because his teaching contradicted the teaching of a certain Greek philosopher of the name of Aristotle, whose philosophy had been mixed up with the Bible in the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Galileo was not against the Bible, but he was against the dogma and the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they persecuted him and silenced him. Now, this is most important. I'm not saying this. this is, these are facts of history. Indeed, most modern historians today are prepared to agree, and they're not Christians, most of them. Most of them are prepared to agree that what gave the greatest impetus to scientific advance and development was the Protestant Reformation. It rid the minds of men of this incubus of Roman Catholic teaching. It brought people back to the Bible itself. And so it gave this mighty stimulus to the whole of science. And if you go on to the next century, you'll find the same thing. People today denounce Puritanism and the period of the Commonwealth. And, and yet, it is a simple fact to say that the Royal Society, and the greatest honor a scientist can have in this country today is to be made a fellow of the Royal Society. The Royal Society came into being in the time of the Commonwealth. Again, secular historians pay tribute to this fact. So we must be clear about this. It isn't the true teaching of Christianity that opposes science and scientific development. It's the false philosophy that the Roman Church had added and still adds to the plain teaching of the Scripture. However, let me put it like this to you. I'm arguing tonight that it is only the Christian who rarely sees the marvel and the glory and the wonder of creation. And I'll prove it like this to you. Go to a man who's not a Christian. Let him be a great scientist, if you like, but he's not a Christian. And ask him to explain to you this marvelous universe in which we live. Bring him up here and ask him to look at this dale, the glory of nature, the mountains and the hills, the rivers and the streams and the valleys and the flowers and the animals, and ask him, what is the explanation of all this? And he'll say, well, it's all an accident. Originally, there were some gases in outer space. They don't tell you where the gases came from, but they say there were gases. And then they say that for some inexplicable reason, an explosion took place in the gases. 
and there was a great bang. And the result of the explosion was some of these gases solidified. That's our universe. That's what they say. The greatest scientists. It's the result of a pure accident. No design, no order, no arrangement whatsoever. That's their teaching. All blind chance. Now, I suggest to you that a view like that doesn't begin to appreciate the greatness and the marvel and the wonder of creation. You see, it takes the Christian to see that. He looks at it all, and he says, how marvelous. Here we are every year, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Look at the flowers. Look at the perfection of the arrangement. Is all this accident? Is all this chance? Has all this just happened? He says, it's impossible. What is it then? Oh, he says, there must be somebody who has produced it all. And the psalmist says it. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, not accident and chance, but a creator. The first verse in the Bible in the beginning, God created. And this makes sense, doesn't it? You see the explanation. And, of course, some of the very greatest scientists have been ready to admit this. Take a man like the late Sir James Jeans. He said at the end of his long life that the result of a lifetime of experimental research in science had driven him to this conclusion, that there must be a great mind at the back of the universe. He went further. He said, God must be a great mathematician. And if he could say that then, before these astronauts landed on the moon, how much more so now? Look at it, my friends. It's all very well to say, you look at the two men walking on the moon and you say, isn't science marvelous? Thank God we got rid of the Bible. We are no longer religious. Here's science. We are advancing. Marvelous. Wonderful. But wait a minute. How did they ever get there? I'll tell you how they got there. They got there because this universe is so made that you can rely upon certain facts. There are what are called the laws of nature. Who put them there? Man didn't. Man's only discovered them. He didn't create them. God put them there. And you know, these men would never have been able to arrive on the surface of the moon were it not that you can rely absolutely upon this order in creation. They built upon this. And that is the explanation of their success. You see, it's only the man who begins to think and to meditate, not the man who gets excited on the surface, but the man who goes on considering it all. Did you know this, for instance? If only this planet on which you and I are living were a very, very tiny distance nearer to the sun, we'd all be burnt up immediately. If it were only the same tiny distance further away from the sun, we'd all freeze up immediately. This planet is at the particular spot which makes life possible. And another thing I can tell you. If the angle between this earth and the moon were not what it is, to the smallest detail, those men would never have landed on the moon. Now, we are asked to believe, you see, by modern science and clever people, that all this is an accident. The thing is ridiculous, my friends. No, no, the man who only sees the marvel and the glory and the wonder of it all is the man who says, the more I look at it, the more I consider it, the more I see this great mind. I see the fingers, the fingers of God, making, manipulating, putting everything in order. How marvel it, marvelous it all is. Have you come to that conclusion? Tell me, when you saw those two men walking on the surface of the moon in your television set, did you just say, how wonderful, how marvelous? Or did you go on looking and thinking and saying, how, what made that possible? What a marvelous thing this universe is. What a design, what a plan, what perfection in every detailed arrangement. What is it? And you fell on your knees and you said, oh, Lord, our Lord, how marvelous is thy name. If you didn't come to that conclusion, you are not a thinker. You're a superficial reactor. You're simply repeating phrases and carried away by the latest event. Well, now, there's this man's first conclusion. But let's go on to his second conclusion. His second conclusion is the uniqueness and the greatness of man. When I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? The uniqueness and the greatness of man. 
He's looked at the marvelous universe, but he doesn't stop at that. He then looks at man and asks this profound question. What is man? How marvelous, how wonderful. But again, I can hear the critic saying, no, no, you're not going to get away with that either. You mustn't say that you Christians are the only people who have the true idea of the greatness and the uniqueness of men. Because, again, it is surely a fact to say that nothing has kept men back and down so much as religion and Christianity. It's been the dope of the people, the opiate of the masses. There it's been holding us back, but thank God last century we got rid of all this, and man has come to his own, and we now see men for what he is. Men come of age, men grown up. What a wonderful creature man is, and look at his achievements. It's science, it's this non-Christian view that really has discovered the uniqueness and the greatness of man. That's the argument. Well, now, how do we meet that? Well, again, we meet it in very much the same way. We turn to this friend and we say, all right, how do you explain men? You're boasting about men. You say we don't need God any longer because men so marvelous. But uh, what is men? Where has he come from? How has he come into being? Where has he got these wonderful powers and propensities? And the answer he gives you is this, that as the whole universe is an accident, so is men. Men, they say, is a creature that has developed and evolved out of nothing, out of some primitive slime, some one cell, undifferentiated matter. That's what they say, there was just this slime, this undifferentiated matter. And then for some reason or another that decided to divide and became more complex. And then that divided again. Why? Nobody knows. Accident, chance, blind forces. And on and on it goes until you come to the animals. Then you go up through the animals, you come to the apes, final step, man. Now, this is the serious teaching that is being offered today as against the biblical view of man, that man is a pure accident and that there's no other explanation of him. But, my dear friends, this surely is something which is quite unacceptable. Surely reason can't accept this. These very astronauts, this very achievement of men, surely demonstrates that this can't be an accident. It can't be the result of some kind of blind chance. Man is too big for that. His achievements are too great. How do you explain man? And here, you see, you've got to come back to the biblical explanation as put by this old psalmist in this eighth psalm. He asks his question, what is man? And then he answers it. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Thou, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. What is man? And the answer is, is not an accident. Man is a creature made in the image and likeness of God. God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. He's not an animal only. He is an animal part, but he's bigger. God said, let's put something of ourselves in this one. This man is going to be our representative. We'll make him just a little lower than the angels. We'll make him the Lord of creation. And isn't this true? How weak man appears to be when you compare him with a lion or a bear or some such animal. How helpless man seems to be compared with the mighty ocean waves or with the pull of gravity. But he's bigger than them. He's the lord of creation. He can tame the lion and the bear. He can master the ocean. He's even conquered the force of gravity. How? Accident? Of course not. He has a mind. He has a reason. These are God-given. God has made him. And he is here as the lord of creation and the representative of the Almighty in this creation and in this world of time. No other view of man is adequate to explain these astounding achievements of modern man. This cannot be an accident. It's too perfect. It's too wonderful. Man has made these amazing discoveries. And the explanation is that he is a creature made in the image and likeness of God. Very well. I ask my second question. You've looked up at the moon and the stars. You've seen the astronauts 
walking on the surface of that moon. What did it lead to? How did you react to it? Did you just say, how marvelous, how wonderful? Thank God we got rid of religion. And then run to the next excitement. Or did you go on looking? And did you end by asking, what is man? What is this little creature that is so capable of even conquering the force of gravity and the pull of the moon and landing men there on that very surface? How marvelous is man? How unique a being is man? Did you arrive at that conclusion? If not, I say again, you're not a thinker. You're just repeating glibly the phrases that you read and that you hear. You've never considered it all and asked the right questions and arrived at the profound conclusions. But let me hurry on to this man's third conclusion. And his third conclusion is this. The problem and the tragedy of men. Now this is amazing, isn't it? We've seen the marvel and the wonder of creation. We've seen the uniqueness and the greatness of men. But now he comes to the problem and the tragedy of men. He puts it like this. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? What he means is this. There's something wrong with men. Why does God need to be mindful of men? Why does God need to visit men? And the answer is because men has become a problem. You see, the whole truth about man is not simply that he's conquered the force of gravity and landed two astronauts on the surface of the moon. That's not the whole truth. Do you know the other part of the truth? It's the modern world. And here you see the problem. You look up at the heavens and at the astronauts and you say, how marvelous man is and how wonderful are his achievements. But then you look at the world as it is tonight, with trouble in Northern Ireland, apartheid in South Africa, rumors of wars, infidelity, divorce, theft, robbery, malice, hatred, the whole tragedy of the modern world. The sensationalism of the last fortnight, the failure of great leaders. And you say, what is man? He's such a brilliant success on the one hand, but he's such an appalling failure on the other. He can conquer the force of gravity, but he can't control himself. What's the matter with men? The problem and the tragedy of men. Have you considered this, my friend? For this, it seems to me, is something that ought to be in the mind and heart of every one of us at this present time. Nothing is so obvious in the modern world as the fact that man is a problem. He's a mass of contradictions. Here he is, I say. Brilliant success. Tragic failure. He can do almost anything. He can't do the most ordinary things. What's the matter with him? And here, I say, is the very essence of our problem. Man is a mass of contradictions. I'd like to show you this. As I do so, let me tell you that something that happened in my experience. It illustrates what I'm saying so perfectly. I happened to be in America on July the 20th, 1969, on that great day. And I'll never forget getting down to breakfast the next morning, the Monday morning. And there, of course, was the newspaper. And as anticipated, in bold type on the left-hand side, the astronauts, man on the moon, and the photographs. This amazing achievement. And there it was standing out. But it wasn't the only thing on that front page. Please turn your cassette over at this point. On the same front page on the right hand side, in equally bold type, there was the announcement of the death of a poor secretary girl in the motor car of Senator Edward Kennedy in a lake in New England. On the same front page, brilliant success, problem, tragedy, failure, Moral muddle. Same page. That's modern men. You mustn't only look at one side, the brilliant achievement. There's this other side. Man is a mass of contradictions. Let me show it you. I think you'll all agree with me when I say that the great thing that impressed us all about these astronauts was their amazing discipline. You read about them, didn't you? You've heard about them. They're still doing this kind of thing. 
How did those astronauts get up there? Well, the explanation was that they underwent very rigorous training for a very long time. They gave up drink, alcohol, they gave up tobacco, smoking, they ceased to live with their wives at a certain point, and they underwent this most rigorous training in order to land on the surface of the moon. Now, here's my question. If man is prepared to discipline himself to that extent in order to work on the surface of the moon, why can't he use the same discipline in the matter of his married life, his home life, the temptations of the call girls, and all the moral muddle of this world of ours? If he can do it there, why doesn't he do it here? If he can land on the moon, why doesn't he make a perfect world? Why not get rid of sin? Why not live a decent and a true and a noble life? That's the question. Modern man, you see, is a mess of contradictions. And this is so obvious in many respects. One respect is this. Modern man is a great hero worshipper, isn't he? It's a characteristic of the age. We're interested in what are called personalities. It's the great word of today, isn't it? Personality. They talk about television personalities. They seem to me to be grinning ninnies, but that doesn't matter. They're called television personality. And you read about people, they'll stand in the rain for hours to have a passing glimpse of one of these little television personalities, or a pop star, or some such ridiculous person. Personalities. Modern man is tremendously interested in personality, he says. And yet, when you ask him to look at the greatest personality this world has ever seen or ever will see, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, he turns his head away in disgust. He won't even look at him. Interested in personality, won't look at the greatest personality. What else? Modern man's very interested in exciting events. Anything unusual that happens, he's interested, he's keyed up, and he wants to hear all about it. And the media go on repeating it ad nauseum. Some remarkable event. All right, there's nothing wrong in this. But all I want to know is this. If modern man is so interested in great and cataclysmic events, why isn't he interested in the greatest event that has ever happened in history or ever can happen? The death of the Son of God on the cross on Calvary's hell. The maker of the universe dying. The Lord of life expiring. What an event! But the modern world says, I couldn't care less. It's not interested. It passes it by with contumely and with scorn. There are the contradictions in men. And so the psalmist asks his question, what's the matter with men? My friend, have you asked that question? Here's the test of whether you're a thinker or not, and whether you're a Christian or not. You can look at the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavens and the astronauts. Any fool can do that. But what's it lead to? Did it make you consider and think and ponder and say, in the light of this, why is the world as it is? What's the matter with men? If it hasn't brought you to that, you don't think. You have no right to call yourself a thinker. You're just a superficial reactor. And you know, there's only one answer to this question of what is wrong with men. Science can't answer it. Philosophy can't answer it. The learning and the lore of the world can't answer it altogether. There is only one answer, and it is this. Man was made in the image and likeness of God. Hence his brilliance. Hence his marvelous achievements. Well then, why is the world as it is? Oh, it is because man in his folly rebelled against his own maker and creator, his own greatest benefactor. In his pride he lifted himself up, and he fell. And he became the slave of the devil and of the world and the flesh and of his own lusts and passions. And here he is, a contradiction. He may be a great man and a great statesman, yet he's the creature of lust and passion that ruins everything. It's the only explanation. The fall of men. Adam and Eve defying God, listening to the devil, and they fell, and the whole of humanity has been fallen ever since in utter hopelessness and constant contradiction. What's the matter with men? And that is the only adequate explanation. And that, in turn, brings me to this man's last conclusion. And thank God for it. Were it not for this last conclusion, we wouldn't be here tonight. And there'd be no hope in this world. This man's last conclusion is this. 
there is only one hope for men, one hope for the world, literally. And I'm here to proclaim this. And I'm here to defy the world. Christian people, we have a unique opportunity today. The world is manifesting its failure. These last weeks have shown us the utter failure of men, the folly of men, the contradiction of men, the utter helplessness of men in the grip of the world and the flesh and the devil. There's literally only one hope. It isn't in science. It isn't in philosophy. It isn't in education. We've had all this. It isn't in the books and the journals. It isn't in the television. What is it? And here he puts it. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of men that thou visitest him? My dear friends, the only hope for the world tonight is this, that it's God's world. He hasn't abandoned it. He is still mindful of it, which means this. He's concerned. He's interested. He thinks. He has a plan for it. The only hope for this world and for any individual in it tonight is that God is concerned and tremendously concerned. He's mindful of it. More than that, that he's visited it. You remember how old Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, put it? God, he says, has visited and redeemed his people. The only hope of the world tonight is this, is that it's God's world. And that even before he created it and before men fell, God had a plan of salvation. He planned it out in eternity before time. He prepared the way of salvation. And its essence is that he sent his only begotten son into the world to visit it and to redeem it. And he has come. Why did he ever come? Well, this is the marvelous thing. He came, he said, to seek and to save that which is lost. And he has done so. He gave himself, his life, his soul, a ransom for many. He bare our sins in his own body on the tree, thereby reconciling us to God. He's conquered our enemies. He's risen again. He's seated at the right hand of God. He'll come again, conquering and to conquer, to destroy all his enemies and set up his glorious kingdom of righteousness, peace and truth and joy everlasting. That's the message. It's the only hope for the world. Is there any other? Do you people still believe in politicians? I'm old enough to remember when men virtually worshipped politicians. I remember hearing a man saying quite seriously to my own father when I was a boy, I won't tell you my age, I, I won't tell you the date or I'll tell you my age, but I happened to be in a trap with my father and we gave a lift to a man and Lloyd George had just been introducing his famous 1909 budget and this man said to my father, he said, you know, this man is going to do much greater good than Jesus Christ and they worshipped politicians and I have an uncomfortable feeling that nonconformity and our churches in general tonight are as they are because our foolish forefathers ceased to worship God and began to worship politicians. They said, you don't need your old gospel of salvation. You need acts of parliament and you'll make a, a new world. Tennyson sang about the parliament of men and the federation of the world. Things were evolving and developing. You didn't need the Bible. You didn't need Christ. You didn't need God. Oh, the tragedy of it all. But I don't think many people believe things like that tonight, do they? We are living in a disillusion and in a cynical world. And therein I see the hope. Everything is failing. Who can you trust? There's only one hope. It's this blessed. It is this glorious gospel. It is the old, old story which is ever new and ever true. Shall I close by putting this old gospel message in a very modern form for you. People say we must be modern and up to date. All right, we can do it. <laughs> Let me put this old message in a very modern form. Do you know literally what is the only hope in this world tonight? I can tell you. It consists in a series of launchings. Launching. What's a launching? Well, everybody knows what a launching is. You've read about it, haven't you? How these men... Go to Cape Kennedy. I think they've changed it back to its old name again now. doesn't matter. It was called Cape Kennedy. And then you read about these men who've been preparing for months and perhaps for years 
they now decide on a given date to enter into a capsule or a nodule. And they're then going to start on their great journey to the moon. And the great day when the journey begins is known as the launching day. And you remember what happened. The men go in, they shut the door and seal it off. Then a rocket is set going beneath the capsule. And up it goes with this tremendous power of propulsion. It, we see it going up through the skies, on and on and on it goes, until eventually the men, the men land on the surface of the moon. The launching day. And everybody's talking about these marvelous launchings. Do you know the only hope for this world tonight? It's in a series of launchings. Do you know what the first was? Well, the Apostle Paul put it like this. When the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his Son, launched him. Not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth. God sent forth his Son. How did he launch him? How did the Son of God ever come from heaven to earth? It was in a capsule, wasn't it? The virgin's womb. The eternal Son of God went into that little capsule, the virgin's womb. And as those astronauts come out of the capsule and walk on the surface of the moon, Jesus Christ came out of the virgin's womb and began to walk back and forth on the surface of this earth, this world, this planet on which you and I live. Why has he come? Why did he come? Well, why do the astronauts go up onto the moon? Well, you know the answer. They go there to make scientific reports and investigations. They gather specimens of dust and bits of rock and do many other things. And they come back and they present their wonderful report. Why did the Son of God ever come into this world? Was it in order to make a report on us? Was it in order to collect certain specimens and take them back to the courts of heaven? Thank God it wasn't. He came to save us. He came to deliver us from the bondage of sin and Satan. He came to reconcile us unto God. He was launched from heaven to earth and came out of the virgin's womb on the face of this earth in order that he might redeem us and reconcile us to God and make us children and joint heirs with Christ. The first launching. But as you know, doing this in this world cost him his life. They rejected him, they crucified him, and they buried him in a grave. He's in another capsule, isn't he? He's entombed, he's encapsulated in a grave. Is that the end of the story? Thank God it isn't. On the morning of the third day, God put the rocket of the resurrection underneath his capsule, and it burst asunder. He burst us under the bands of death. He began to rise. He manifested himself to various chosen witnesses for 40 days. And he ascended into heaven in the sight of some of them. Launched again. Passed through the heavens. And took his seat on the right hand of the glory. In the majesty on high. And there he sits. And there he reigns. Until he's launched again. And this time it won't be in a capsule. It won't be the virgin's womb. There'll be no death. He will come riding the clouds of heaven. Surrounded by the holy angels, king of kings, lord of lords, he'll come conquering and to conquer, and he'll judge the whole world in righteousness, and all who have not believed in him, he will consign to eternal misery and perdition, and all who believed in him, he'll gather unto himself. They'll be changed and glorified, and they'll live and reign with him in the glory everlasting. That's the message. It's a series of launchings of the blessed, eternal Son of God. My friend, did looking up at those astronauts make you think in this way and arrive at these conclusions? I can hear somebody saying, certainly not, and why should it? I've no doubt you're interesting some old people who are listening to you tonight, but I'm a modern young person. I'm not interested in your launchings, aren't you? Well, my friend, it's about time you became interested in launchings. Do you know why? It is because a day will come quite soon in your life and story when you are going to be launched. You're a modern man, all right. You're living in the days of science, in the atomic age. You know so much. 
and you're not interested in the Bible and in Christianity. You say all this is entirely irrelevant. Is it? You've got to die, my friend. A day is coming when the rocket of death will be placed beneath your capsule that you're living in. This body is but a capsule. And when the rocket of death is set beneath it, your spirit, your soul will go out of it. And you'll ascend, you'll pass through the heavens, and you'll stand in the presence of God. This is the message of the Bible from beginning to end. It is appointed unto all men once to die, and after death, the judgment. And however much you may know, and whatever you may think, you can't evade it, you can't avoid it. National health services have not abolished death, and never will. We've all got to be launched, we've all got to leave this world, and all who are around us, and we'll pass through the heaven, and there stand before God in the last asylum. Tell me, my friend, have you ever thought about that? You got very excited about the astronauts, didn't you? Yes, but you know this. Those men would never land on the surface of the moon were it not for very careful, very minute, and very meticulous preparation. Think of the heat of the sun blazing upon that little capsule. Think of the power and the heat of the rocket that sends it up. It's got to be strong enough to withstand this. And then it begins to move. Meteorites may hit into it. And on and on it goes. And there's the pull of gravity. And then the sun and various other hazards. You know these marvelous scientists. They've catered for every one of them. Hence the success of the project. They've spent years in visualizing and contemplating everything that can conceivably happen. And they've answered it. The capsule is so made that the blazing heat of the sun doesn't scorch it up. They've got a problem in this respect at this moment, haven't they? And they're solving it as they will. But they've made all these meticulous, minute preparations. Have you made any preparation for you are launching? It's going to happen. And you can't evade it or avoid it. Tell me, have you made any calculations? Have you ever contemplated how you were going to deal with the blazing heat of the holiness of God? How are you going to do it? You'll have to. How are you going to answer the Ten Commandments and their accusations? How are you going to deal with the Sermon on the Mount? How are you going to deal with the lives of the saints? They'll be there facing you. They're in the glory. Why not you? You've got to answer these. These are the things that are certainly going to happen to us. Have you made any preparation? If you haven't, you're not a thinker. You're the biggest fool in the universe. To go on living day by day with this certain fact of death without making any provision or preparation, it is sheer lunacy. It's the absence of thinking. And let me show you why there are two reasons why you and I should be much more urgent about this preparation than those astronauts have ever been. What are they? Well, here's the first. In the case of the astronauts, the day of the launching, the exact time of the launching, is always known well ahead of time. If I remember rightly, in the first instance, we were told six months before the launching the exact date of the launching and the very moment when they'd arrive on the surface of the moon. That's true, isn't it? Do you know the date of your launching? You don't. You never know when it's going to come. You may be young, yes, but youth is no respecter of viruses and certain other lethal diseases. You may have to go at any moment, and yet you've made no preparation. That's one difference. And then there's a second difference. You remember how, don't you, in the case of the astronauts, some experiments that they made went wrong. Do you remember that tragic event just about a year before July the 20th, 1969, Three unfortunate astronauts went into a capsule, into a nodule. The rocket was set off and the poor men were immediately burned to death. But that didn't put an end to the project. No, no. Science is trial and error. Something goes wrong, you correct it and put it right and you try again. And you go on repeating the experiment until at last it's all right and the two men land on the surface of the moon. Many, many trials. But my dear friend, in your case and mine... There's no second chance. Our eternal destiny is decided in this world. It's either to be with God in the glory indescribable, 
or it's to be in eternal misery and wretchedness and useless remorse forever and forever. And it is entirely decided in this world, if you die in your sins, there's no second chance, no second opportunity. Once and once only. In the name of God, I ask you, have you made any preparation for your launching? Have you ever considered how you're to give an account of your life and your soul to the God who made you and who has so blessed you in spite of your rebellion? Are you ready to meet him? If not, I say, don't talk to me about thinking. You haven't started to think. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Have you thought about it? Oh, says someone, what's the use of saying that? I see now that God is so holy and so perfect, and I am so sinful that if I had an eternity to prepare, I could never do it. You're perfectly right. You're perfectly right. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone, and blessed be his name, he has done so. You and I can never make the preparation, but you know God, in his infinite love, has already made it for us. He's already provided a capsule. The nodule is there. Jesus Christ, he's God's capsule that will take us to heaven, whatever may happen to us. And all you and I have to do is to confess and acknowledge our sin, see our utter and complete hopelessness, and step into the nodule. Enter into Christ, and there you are eternally safe. My dear friend, this is the glory of this gospel, that what is impossible with men is possible with God. And God sent his only Son into the world in order that we might be in him and in Christ. We are everlastingly safe, safe in time, safe in death, safe in eternity. And we can say, cannot we not, with Augustus top lady, the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view, safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast. Are you there, my dear friend? Let me plead with you. Before it is too late, the door of the capsule is still open. Enter in and be eternally safe. And then you'll be ready to join with me in singing some of these great old hymns. You know, I've discovered in these last years that some of these old hymn writers of 200 years ago seem to have some prophetic insight into this launching that's taking place. Have you ever noticed this in the hymn that I've just quoted? Augustus Top Lady's Rock of Ages. Do you remember his last verse? Listen to him. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, listen, when I soar through tracts unknown, he's been launched, he's passing up, through tracts unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. So sang the Calvinist, Augustus Toplady. But he'd got a contemporary. And they argued violently. A great Arminian, Thomas Oliver's. But you know, at this point, they say exactly the same thing. You know the great hymn, The God of Abraham Prays. Listen to Thomas Oliver's. He by himself hath sworn, I on his oath depend. I shall... On eagle's wings are born to heaven ascend. He's going to be launched, but he's quite safe. The eagle wings will hold him up. I shall behold his face 
I shall his power adore and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. And then a woman put it so perfectly. Listen to her. All the way my Savior leads me. All the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. Listen. When my spirit, clothed immortal, wings its flight to realms of day. She'd anticipated all this. This shall be my endless story. Jesus led me all the way. Are you being led by him? While there is still time. Become encapsulated in Christ and thereby be safe and saved for time and for eternity. Let us pray. O Lord our God, like thy servant the psalmist of old, we are amazed that thou art still mindful of us, and that thou didst ever visit us in thine only begotten, dearly beloved Son. We are unworthy of the very least of thy mercies, we are proud and arrogant and boastful. And yet we are utterly and completely helpless and hopeless and vile. And we realize our only hope this evening is thine amazing grace. O oh God, we thank thee that thou hast ever opened our eyes to have but a glimpse of it. And should there be anybody present here tonight who has never seen it, Lord, have mercy. Thou alone canst open the eyes of the blind. None other can do this. Have mercy, we humbly pray thee. God save the people. And unto thee, and unto thee alone, shall we give all the praise and all the honor and all the glory, both now and forever. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.